Hello everyone, a very good afternoon to all our esteemed guests and participants of today. I'm Erin Sabah, welcome you all on behalf of BIPS. Thank you so much for coming here today and to have our round table with Dhaka Tribune on Global Trends 2022. Now I would like to request Major General A.N.M. Munir Zaman, President of BIPS, to give his welcome remarks and to moderate the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Saba. Ambassadors, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you and assalamu alaikum. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to our monthly roundtable on key strategic issues that we together host with the Dhaka Tribune. Our this month's topic is on Global Trends 2022. Global trends every year indicates the critical issues and scenarios that pave the way for international events that shape for the rest of the year and beyond. We live in an interconnected world. So a scenario anywhere is a scenario everywhere. So what happens in major capitals of the world has a direct impact on critical issues of policy in all states, including Bangladesh. Therefore, it is extremely important for us to understand what is going to drive 2022. We identify some critical issues regarding trade and commerce and economy. We identify critical issues of security and technology and geopolitics and strategy. As we navigate the COVID-19 and are looking for ways to get out of it, we understand that we stand at a critical juncture where there is tremendous vaccine inequity resulting in an uneven recovery that we are projecting in 2022 and beyond. In a scenario of uneven economic recovery, there could be several economic shocks that countries, including Bangladesh, can face in the coming year. We also understand that all the trends that we are trying to analyze and understand not only has consequences, but they also have second tier and third tier consequences, what I would call consequences of consequences. So we need a holistic understanding of all the forces that are at play here. There are also forces of deglobalization that is turning upon us, forcing many economies to adjust in a way which is not conducive to their growth. We are in a phase where we see forces of populism driving the politics of many nations. We have grave issues of demography and the problem of aging in many developed societies and countries. At the same time, the population continues to grow globally. So the divergent forces of aging and depopulation is a critical issue that will be on the top of the agenda in the current year. We also identify that we are living in a data-driven world. Data and information will determine everything that we do. But we see increasing tendencies of data nationalism, which is again not conducive to international growth. We are going to experience this year a changed relationship between human and adult we are at a very critical juncture post Glasgow, how we determine our relationship with the earth where we live. So the forces of the nexus of food, water and energy will determine many of the courses of agenda in the current year. Of course, I must say that disruptive technology will also be a critical factor 
to understand the events of the current year. There is now a direct linkage between technology and strategy, technology and global politics, technology and nationalism. So these factors will determine the agenda for the current year. We are in the process of what I call the global urbanization. A rapid pace of urbanization is turning the world into a different place that we will experience in the coming year and beyond, with many cities turning into mega cities. And the number of mega cities will probably double by the next year, many of them falling in the Asian continent. So therefore, we are going to experience a whole lot of changes in the current year. Countries like Bangladesh and many countries in other parts of the world must understand the events that are going to shape the events and the scenarios of the current year and beyond. It is important for smaller nations to understand them even better so that we are not surprised. We don't go into strategic shocks, which can completely destabilize economies, politics, and relations of a country. And finally, we can never rule out what is called black swans, unknown events that we don't know, completely forgotten events that can revisit us. What could be a black swan? The best example that comes to my mind is something like a solar geomagnetic event that can knock off the complete global satellite system in matters of minutes, leaving us without communication, leaving us without electricity, leaving us with the many of the known, understood ways or means how we communicate with each other. That could be a black swan event. So we should be all prepared for all kinds of eventualities so that we charter our course better in the current year and beyond. To discuss many of these issues in detail, we have an excellent panel this afternoon who will be deliberating on these issues in depth. So we will first start with Dr. Debopriya Bhattacharya, who is going to talk to us about economy and trade. Doctor, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, General, for inviting me to this August gathering and picking up a very pertinent but a complex set of issues for this afternoon discussion. Global trends. So my grandmother told me once, and those who know heard about it already, that she said that, son, if you go to a very August gathering, never make more than three points. They will never remember the fourth one you said. So I will stick to my three points. So my three points today afternoon is that one of the major important dimensions of the global trend is the pandemic and vaccination. The second one is about what's happening in the economy, particularly the economic trends for 2022. And the third issue is that what it all means for Bangladesh. So these are the three issues I would seek your attention for. So let me start with the vaccination issue. So the first and foremost issue, of course, is the vaccine equity issue. Whether the vaccine equity issue will moderate in 2022 or not, that's the challenge. So as of today, if you look at the world population, then about after this over 6 billion people and 75% of them have been vaccinated in the developed countries. Whereas another 20, only 25% 20, 
of the rest of the world has been vaccinated. So that will bring out the disparity in terms of vaccination process, what is going on at this moment. So in other words, one out of every nine person in the developing world has been vaccinated. Whereas if you in the developing developed world, two out of every three person has been vaccinated. And if you go through the number of vaccines they ha it has been, has been administered, then you will see how the number falls dramatically. We have wide divergence like 92-95% of vaccination rate in Cuba, whereas only 1% vaccination in Chad or for that matter Burundi or Democratic Repub or Republic of Congo. So will this gap reduce in the, in the coming days or not? It seems that that reduction will take place up to a point through more intensified vaccination in certain countries, particularly in the middle income countries, including Bangladesh. So where do Bangladesh stands at this moment? So if you look at Bangladesh, so at least one person, uh, at least one dose has been administered to 57% of the population as of today, which would be at about 81% of the target population which the government has thought of. And two doses is to close to 36% of the population, which is almost equal to the target population because the target population was defined in a much more circumspect way. And three doses is 1.5%, something like that. So you also see within the country, there's a wide variation in terms of three doses, two doses, and one doses within the country. And this variation is much more stark. If you go through the numbers, there is a gender gap in it because the men have been vaccinated more than the women. Uh, the urban population has been vaccinated more than the rural population. Within the rural, those who are much more difficult places to go to, they have been vaccinated much less, apart from the other issues uh, where there is lack of enthusiasm for that. So the global process in this case is whether it is going to facilitate in the coming days or not. The cost of the vaccine remains an enigma for most of us. We hardly know at what cost we have imported our own vaccines and what had been the administration charge so in terms of delivery. So the global assessment says that the figure varies from $2 to $40. So it depends on the source from $2 to $40. And the cost of delivery is no less than $4 per person. So it will be interesting to see whether in the coming years, whether this cost of production, procurement, and delivery will somehow be moderated or not. One of the school of thoughts which thinks to how to do this thing is to do away with the intellectual property right restrictions. So in the WTO, the countries like South Africa, India had been moving this proposal to do away at least temporarily with the IP restrictions. It is known as the IP waiver proposal which is being debated at WTO. Only last week in the General Assembly, this issue has been discussed. It is gathering momentum. U.S. has come on board. European Union reluctantly coming on board. U.S. has been more uh, enthusiastic than U European Union because of the production and other income issues over involved. But the experts are telling that even if we reduce, we, we relax the IP-related restriction, it doesn't mean that it will be a silver silver bullet for the solution as a solution, because there are still problem in terms of uh, raw material supply for these vaccines. There are problems in terms of equipments. There are problems in terms of complexity with manufacturing. And of course, the cold chain storage and delivery itself is a great challenge in many parts of the world. So the, on my first point, the conclusion is that the inequality or inequity in vaccination process 
will persist. It may get moderated in certain part of the world, but with the emergence of new variants, Omicron, Delta, and God knows what will come in the future, this will remain one of the persistent problems for the global economy, and not only from the health perspective, but the socio-economic fallouts and the consequences which it will entail in that way. And Bangladesh will have to deal with it as well, because not only on the financial front, not only on procurement and distribution, but also in terms of reaching out to those who are yet to be brought under the vaccination coverage. So 2022 will, in the global ed agenda, vaccination will, vaccine vaccination will remain as one of the important challenges in the coming days. And Bangladesh will no way will be able to escape that. Coming to the economic issue on my second point, you see, we are now in the third year of the pandemic. Get 2022. If we, uh, we are getting into 2022, so it started off in 1920. Um, in some cases, people will say in late 19, but in Bangladesh, we got it in March 2020. And then we had the 2021 and entering in 2022. So it's third year. If you look at these three years, then 20 was really a very disruptive year. If 20 was a disruptive year, then in 2021, um, we managed it till the middle of the year. The globe, global economy managed it till the, uh, till the middle of the year. And the pessimism went up towards the second half of 2021. So the world recovery, however patchy, however, you know, un uh, unbalanced in that way, had been there in the 2021 towards the end second half of 2021. Unfortunately, that optimism is withering away. So if throughout the 20 and up to the middle of 2021, we dealt with the serious fallouts or the, you know, the robust pandemic onslaught, then if a year and a year and a half, then during the second half of 2021, we saw the recovery picking up. And it also had been relevant for Bangladesh as well. In, but towards the end of 2021, I think this situation is, going, is undergoing a change. I will come to the elements of those changes. But which essentially means that 2022, as it was conceived or perceived in 2021, and all those optimistic projections about the global economy, as well as Bangladesh and region, are not going to withstand anymore. That is the bad news. And if you look at the World Economic Forum's projections, if you look at World, uh, World Bank's projections, UN uh, SCAP's projection, UN DESA's project, projections, and also the private uh, merchant bankers and also the credit rating agencies, all of them have moderated their forecast downward in the recent past, IMF included. So what you hear or had been hearing people uh, earlier were based on the first three months data. And usually the projections are made the, on the first three months data and, and then you start improving the database and the projection gets revised. People quite often get stuck to the good news and fall, doesn't really follow the bad news coming after that. And obviously, politically, this becomes a major uh, touchy point in that way. You really want to get your credentials based on the international agency's projection, although they may not have any clue what they're talking about quite often. So why these changes, is, changes are happening? The changes are happening because in the world economy, we are seeing a number of negative trends which are coming out. The first and foremost is that because of those recovery, initial recovery process, they created a serious supply and demand imbalance in that way. Uh, many of the idle capacities were not being able to brought on board immediately with that kind of flexibility and that kind of a turnaround time. So it created a serious supply demand you know, imbalance uh, over there. 
the supply chain disruption also did not go away. And the supply chain disruption and the supply demand imbalance was most acute, as you will see in the case of supply of semiconductors. And the world economy, the world manufacturing cannot really survive without the supply of these semiconductors. So that was one of the major issues, the two issues, the supply uh, demand imbalance and also the issue of supply chain disruptions. Along with that came the commodity prices. The commodity prices, because of the high demand or the rising demand and inability to bring in the production and supplies in line with the demand, the commodity prices went up. The most evident area where the commodity prices went up, as you understand, was the energy sector. The oil prices started to increase and along with that, other fuel prices starting from LNGs and others also went up along with that. The fuel price increase essentially led to some other consequences which I will come to that. Along with that, the fuel prices, the other commodity prices then, or alloy and nickels and all other minerals goods which are essential for the semiconductor production and other types of uh, production, uh, sophisticated production, materials were out of low supply. The sourcing was a major problem. That was not all of it. Along with that came the food prices increase. The food prices increase in all types of grains, along with that came all over there. So the food prices increase, uh, commodity prices increase in, in terms of fuel and others, obviously led to an increased cost of production and rising inflation globally. So you will see if the global inflation was low throughout the decades at 2%, something like that, so it is now being projected to be around 5%. So, and it will not get moderated throughout the 2022 till the production comes in line with the demand. And we might see some respite in only in 2023. Uh, please remember these points when I come back again to Bangladesh on these issues. The, the consequence, the commodity prices increase and this disruption in supplies was also created by the fact that the manufacturing, post-pandemic manufacturing was also undergoing structural change. First and foremost, in order to reduce their costs, they, they wanted to reduce the inventory cost, so the storage cost of all the manufacturing. As a result, there was severe pressure also on the, the transportation system. The maritime transport costs have gone up significantly in this period. And those who are dependent on imported goods, uh, whether it is rice, whether it is oil, whether it is, uh, you know, raw materials for garments or whatever it is, they have to pay not only the higher price of the cotton, but also in terms of higher prices of the shipments and other things over there. So that is a major thing which is happening, a new consolidation process within the manufacturing sector that as, as, we, as we see. So in the coming days, what we will see more is for the international economy, the issue is about commodity prices going up, it is about cost of productions going up, it is about the shipment cost going up, logistics costing, becoming costlier and definitely inflation is the villain of the piece. At the end of the day, after <coughs> protracted period of very subdued inflation, Possibly for the first time, the world economy is facing the inflationary challenge. The demon is once again out of its cave, possibly. And if you look at these things as they are unfolding, they have other fiscal implications because in order to contain the inflation, the well-known mechanism for the economists and particularly the beloved method for the monetarists is that you control your fiscal uh, expansion, which was so important in terms of dealing with the post-pandemic uh, you know, demand shortfall. The demand shortfall coming from the public private side was really contained through public investment. This was a, uh, this was a uh, you know, global consensus that we need to go for an expansionary policies. And we 
I will come to Bangladesh, but in globally it was there. As a result, in most of these countries, the central banks are now resorting to increasing the cost of lending, which means increasing the interest rate. With the developing, developed world increasing the interest rate, so what we see is essentially, and the private capital re relocating itself, diversion to the more developed economies than to the developing economies. So the financial flow, which appeared to be quite neutral in the earlier years, all of a sudden is feeling the pressure of going more to the developed countries than to the developing world. So the financial liquidity issue is becoming a major issue also for the trade and not to talk about investment and foreign direct investment on that. So I will not um, further elaborate on these issues. We can discuss if you have more interest on this. But the, the global trade and global growth will remain high, will remain positive, not high, will remain positive, but it will not be as it was conceived at least three months back. And this will have implication in terms of fiscal policy changes, monetary policy changes in the uh, developed countries, and it will have inflationary impact, no doubt about that accordingly, as you will see. So what does all these things mean for Bangladesh? This, so Bangladesh, as you know, is a very globalized country now. At least 60% of our economy is now linked to the global economy, if not more. This includes exports, imports, FDI, remittances, and ODA, the Overseas Development As Official Development Assistance. So if you add them up, they will be 60 to 70 percent, depending upon the flows of remittances, how it goes up and down and etc. So in certain ways, Bangladesh economy is more linked to the global economy in certain ways than it is linked to its domestic economy in that way. So the backward linkages are not necessarily as strong with the domestic economy as it should have, should have been. Uh, although these external economies, interlinkages do have downward, backward uh, pressures or implications, but it is not as strong as one would have loved to see. So what is happening in, in these four areas, as you will see? You know, um, a couple of months back, I made a comment and created a lot of stir at that time. Um, uh, back in uh, September, September last year, I said, uh, the magic of the remittance flow is withering away or going out. I think many, including the finance minister, uh, took it upon himself to contest me. But the subsequent figures have shown us how it has gone down. So if you look at the last four months, the data we have for July, August, September, up to uh, November, the five months. So if during those five months in 2021 fiscal year, we got almost $11 billion. We now have $8.6 billion for that same period. So significant short uh, downward trend in that way. There is no optimism at this moment regarding this trend will go up above the as high as it was in 1920 when we say that people were bringing in more because of the last savings and also because of the 2.5% incentive provided for the exchange rate. And that was really the case. And we, we are now, and this is one of the major issues. This issue, I think people think in terms of foreign exchange reserve and in foreign exchange flow, etc. I think the major issue is that it is going to have significant implication in our consumption demand because of this, how it is going to finance the rural economy, the consumptions over there, the, including the health expenditure, education expenditure, and how it will impact on the poverty circumstances, and particularly for the new poor. As you know, we have defined the new poor, not the traditional poor, are those returning migrants find work overseas again to go back and also in within the country at this moment. So remittance remains one of the, you know, uh, deciding determinants how it will do 
not only in terms of external, but also in our domestic uh, economic circumstances as it goes. The other part of it is, of course, trade. Uh, we are very enthusiastic or jubilant about the fantastic export growth in the recent past, but we quite often forget the larger part, incremental part of this export growth is because of rise in commodity prices. Because of the cotton price has gone up and we import those cottons and yarn and then we send them out. So obviously those prices are built in, into that export prices. So it is not because we have gained more competitiveness and exporting more, but because the cost of production has gone up and we are having much more thinner margin in exporting the garments products globally over, over there. So if you look at now the trade part, and we also forget that every export, possibly $1 export has 75 to 60 cents of imports behind it. And as a result, we see the import has been going up very strongly along with the imports for our mega projects and other things. The I, I, will, do, I will do that. So, uh, so this one has become a major issue over there. And the trade deficit, if it was only $5 billion last year for the first five months, it is $12 billion this year at this moment. So the trade deficit will increase. And you will see the current account deficit is similarly is at its highest level, almost uh, $6.2 billion of deficit at this moment, which may go up by the end of the year to $10 billion in that way. So what are the implications in terms of all these things? And the balance of payment in general has deteriorated further. We are having, uh, if last year at that time we had $2 billion, it is now $5 billion at this moment. And it will increase tremendously because of the imports which are going to happen and increase commodity prices. So let me conclude by what exactly stands for Bangladesh under the circumstances. Bangladesh is already feeling the pressure because of the high demand on import and lower inflow of remittances and lower exports vis-a-vis -vis that. So it, it, the foreign exchange is under tremendous pressure at the rate is under tremendous pressure. You are seeing the, in the car market, the difference is increasing. The government is trying to deal with it through the incentives, is expanding its scope, but this is not a viable option in the future because at the end of the day, we need a competitive exchange rate policy in order to adjust to the realistic or effective situation as we have. Dual exchange rate de facto doing is no good economics as we all know from the Pakistan period and thereafter. So the other part of it is that if exchange rate is under pressure and we think that because of the high exchange rate pressure, if we devalue, then the inflation will get fueled. So we are reticent about that. But the issue is that the inflation rate is also increasing, not so much because of the exchange rate, but because of your cost of production and other issues which are involved over there, the inefficiencies within the economy and the lower productivity of labor which we have at this moment. I won't go into the details how the labor productivity is almost half of our competing countries starting from Vietnam and other things. So in economics, you know, we say we have this devil's trilemma. You have to manage three things at the same time, exchange rate, inflation, and the third one is interest rate. Till now, the government is not conceding of manage, increasing the interest rate because it has the, this peculiar idea that the interest rate is the major problem in holding back investment, which it is not. Our studies have shown that. It is other cost of doing business which affects much more the enabling environment and et cetera and logistics than the interest rate in terms of holding back investment. So the government at certain point will have to deal with in, a, a interest rate adjustment upward as it has been holding it this 9.6 as it uh, over there. So government is at the same time will be also under pressure to do the public finance in the right way. 2022 will demand much more dynamic macroeconomic management. Unfortunately, this is my personal opinion, I see the macroeconomic management is at autopilot at this moment. The macroeconomic management is on autopilot because separate parts of the 
organizations are dealing with it separately and it was most epitomized uh, through the adjustment of the fuel prices without coordination and anything else. So to conclude, in the coming 2022, Bangladesh will have to look, uh, keep a strong, you know, vigilance on its external front, remittance, uh, FDI marginally, and uh, export imports. And only good news on that part is that we have more foreign aid this year than in earlier years. So foreign aid has been, been a welcome development. And in the coming days, it will have to continue with its fiscal policies of supporting the poor, disadvantaged, and post-pandemic recovery. For that, it will have to do some structural reforms, improving the efficiencies, and uh, as a, uh, in general, looking into the domestic economy, how to prop up its demand and complement the fall in exports, if any, in the future. So I think for 2022, I think it's a, any finance minister's dream to manage dynamically and show results. But that would mean undoing the autopilot. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your message has been quite sobering, if I understand that correctly. And I understand that we will be facing multiple challenges in the current year financially. And we'll be under severe pressures on the fiscal front, on other fronts as well. There is also the triple challenges of inflation, commodity price hike, and also debt levels increasing in many countries, including Bangladesh. So therefore, 22 is going to be a year for challenge in Bangladesh. But our, in our next segment, we're going to hear from Shafkat about technology and security. You might ask why technology has been linked with security. In the emerging technology world, everything that emerges has direct linkages and connotations to security. And therefore, we today live in a technopolar world. In the technopolar world, everything has got strategic and security implications. To talk about these issues, I will now request Shafka to take the floor and give us his thoughts and ideas on security and technology. Shavkat, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, we just heard an excellent presentation on the economic trends and the challenges that Bangladesh could face. So I now have a rather daunting task of weaving security and technology and the trends that we see in 2022. Let me first uh, talk about the security trends as I see them. I divide security trends uh, in five parts, to start with potential security flashpoints, then to talk about new domains of warfare, the transference of strategic tensions from land to the sea, hybrid warfare, and lastly, unabated arms race. And then we'll come to technology later. But potential flashpoints itself can be broken down into multiple ways. Now, a conversation on the 30th of January 2022 about potential security flashpoints cannot start or finish without talking about Ukraine. So as we speak, the Russian and Ukrainian forces are eyeball to eyeball with one another. And although we have heard time and again that there will be no conflict, especially from Russia, but the tension remains quite high. But I think it's important for us to look at both uh, viewpoints. And from the Russian side, we have heard that President Putin has said that their security concerns need to be heard and addressed. Or contraire, on the American side, we have heard from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that any uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine will have very disastrous consequences. So we here in Dhaka hope that uh, ultimately good sense will prevail and conflict can be avoided. We now move to the Taiwan Straits, the other potential security flashpoint that we are studying in uh, 2022. Now, you might uh, ask me that why are we talking about Taiwan Strait because it's not a new issue, and I agree it's not a new issue. But off late, and most recently as of yesterday, if you see the Chinese ambassador to the United States' a statement, uh, it tells us that the Taiwan Strait is once again back in the front burner in terms of security thinking. And especially there's a growing fear in Beijing 
that there are uh, strong forces emerging in Taiwan who advocate for independence. And that could lead to a potential conflict in the Taiwan Strait. And I do not need to belabor on the point that any conflict in the Taiwan Strait has significant economic ramifications, including for us. The third flashpoint that I want to look at has direct consequences for Bangladesh. And that is the border between China and India. And we have seen over the last couple of years several incidents taking place between India and China. We saw the clashes in the Galwan Valley. In 2017, we saw uh, the standoff at Doklam. Although I might uh, say that we have now reached a stage of a stalemate, and some of the talks have been fairly fruitful, but fear remains that uh, the border between China and India could again go hot, particularly in the area of Arunachal Pradesh or the disputed Macmon line, so uh, which has direct consequences for Bangladesh, and that is an issue we have to observe very carefully. The Korean Peninsula never really quite goes out of the news cycle. And just today we saw the news about the launch of the intermediate range ballistic missile by North Korea. And again, we are seeing accelerated testing of missiles and the sort of bonhomme that was created particularly in the Trump era of finding a potential peaceful solution has kind of withered away. So the Korean Peninsula is very much back in our attention. And for countries in North Asia, Korean Peninsula con continues to remain a major security flashpoint. Lastly, when we talk about security flashpoints, I want to round up by talking about the South China Sea, which has remained a problematic for quite some time. But off late, we are again seeing renewed tensions in the South China Sea. And as we look ahead towards 2022, the South China Sea will continue to remain a flashpoint. Let us now turn to new domains of warfare. The nature of warfare, ladies and gentlemen, is changing fundamentally. And we already have the introduction of the fifth domain of war or cyberspace. But we are seeing contestations emerging in space. We are seeing new variants of information operations and warfare morphing into multiple different variants. And I will talk about hybrid war in a bit. But the traditional concept of warfare as we have known it for millennia is going through a fundamental shift, and especially with the uh, increasing militarization of space. We are also noticing tensions shifting from the domain of land to the sea. And nowhere perhaps it is more pertinent in than in the Indian Ocean region, which is our patch in the maritime domain. We are seeing increasing strategic competition in the oceans, particularly as the rise of powers is happening. And in the Indian Ocean in particular, we see increasing competition between China and also with other Indian Ocean littoral countries and countries outside the Indian Ocean littoral. We have competing strategies developing in the Indian Ocean. We have several new naval exercises happening. For instance, a major naval exercise is happening between Russia, China, and Iran which has been, um, which has caused a bit of a stir lately. And I would argue that contentions would continue in the maritime domain as competing claims emerge, new powers rise, and new permutations and combinations of, uh, or calibrations of power take place uh, around the oceans. Fourth, we look at hybrid warfare or what has been more popularly known as the Valery Gerasimov Doctrine. Uh, BIPS is one of the few think tanks, uh, I would say, in Bangladesh and in the region, which has actually spent quite a bit of time and energy in studying hybrid warfare, and especially what it means. The way we see it, that hybrid warfare is coming as a game changer. And we are seeing that, uh, we have seen that in many places. We are seeing part of that in Ukraine as well, where multiple uh, applications of different ways of warfare are emerging. So it's not just militaries fighting each other, but it's an employment of political warfare, of a deployment of disinformation, 
of irregular warfare, uh, extending malign influence and so on. Now, you might ask me whether hybrid warfare is something completely new. Perhaps some of these concepts have existed for quite some time, but we have never seen their concerted application like the way we see now. And uh, in coming conflicts, we are probably going to see a greater deployment of hybrid warfare. And for us in Bangladesh in particular, it is very important to understand and study what hybrid warfare means for us. Lastly, in terms of security trends, we see an unabated arms race. Despite all our uh, progress on disarmament and non-proliferation, we are seeing an unabated arms race in terms of both conventional and nuclear weapons picking up again. We hear about hypersonic weapons being developed by China. We hear about circular delivery is also being tested with weapons orbiting across the Earth and then trying circular delivery. So all this new developments in uh, weapons development will actually create an arms race which has multiple security consequences for all countries in our region. And this is something in Bangladesh we have to study quite keenly. Let us now take a look at some of the technology trends and then see how they interplay with security. No discussion, ladies and gentlemen, on technology today is complete without talking about artificial intelligence. AI will essentially determine everything that we do in the coming days. Whether it's peaceful use of AI, use of AI for surveillance, war warfare, AI will be a very important determinant technologically of our future. And particularly for countries like Bangladesh, we have to really study and understand how well we can integrate AI into our daily lives because other countries are already starting to do that. So we have a lot of uh, catching up to do. We're also in an era, and uh, uh, President Bips earlier talked about disruptive technologies. And a couple related to that, we're also in an era where we have autonomous weapon systems coming into the horizon. So we are entering a phase of warfare where humans no longer will be the only delivery or decision-making mechanism. We are entering an era where we will have killer drones, where drones will acquire target and make the decision of engagement basically on its own judgment. Now that throws up a whole question of ethics and laws of warfare. That also throws up a whole question where we are controlling technology or technology is controlling us. So that is something we have to really understand, and it has tremendous security ramifications. Coupled with autonomous weapon systems, we also have the rise of robotics, and robotics is going to rise at a very rapid pace. Robotics, when I talk about robotics, I'm not just talking about the employment of robotics in warfare, but also the employment of robotics in terms of system of production, consumption, and delivery, which will ultimately become dependent on robots. And for countries like ours, which are labor intensive, export dependent, this has direct connotations in terms of future of work. Uh, some of you will recollect in 2019, in another era, pre-COVID, we had a major conference on digitalization, where we were one of the few uh, early or, uh, few organizations to look at uh, the, future, the concept of future of work quite early on. And I think there needs to be a lot more work done in Bangladesh on this issue that with greater inclusion of robotics and technology, what does future of work look like for countries like Bangladesh? We're also entering an era, ladies and gentlemen, where our digital universe will be completely altered by what is now known as metaverse. We will have an er era of augmented reality where many of our interactions on, in the internet would be very different from the kind of interactions and the kind of activities we have now. I don't want to uh, get lost in technical jargons, but we are increasingly going to have a situation where our ability to adapt in the metaverse would be as important as our ability to adapt in terra firma. So we are talking about a pace of technological advancement which is largely unfathomable. Uh, we are already talking about 5G, some countries are even talking about 6G. And for metaverse to be implemented, a 5G plus internet would be absolutely necessary. 
So for countries like Bangladesh, it is absolutely critical that we begin our work early in this area so that we don't get lost in the, or we don't get behind in the technological race. We are also looking at an area, area a period where quantum computing and machine learning will be virtually dominate whatever we do. So the way we impart education, the way we uh, interact with one another on the internet, particularly in terms of sharing knowledge and information, will alter significantly. And therefore, being ahead of the curve in terms of these technological developments is absolutely crucial for countries like Bangladesh. It is also important for us to understand that uh, getting ahead in terms of technology is not just about finances or not just about resources. It is also a lot about innovation. And therefore, uh, as these technological advancements take place, it is absolutely important for us to remain ahead of the curve, to have out of the box thinking, and to have a whole of government and whole of society approach towards integrating some of these changes. And when we, going back to the security trends, while Ukraine might be very far for us, <coughs> excuse me, or the Korean Peninsula might seem very remote, but whatever happens in any of these global flashpoints will ultimately affect Bangladesh. So for us, these discussions are very important because we, in this interconnected world, what happens in one region does not remain confined to that region only. So these are some of the thoughts that I wanted to share. I'll stop there and come back again during Q&A. Thank you very much. Shankar, thank you. Uh, for covering for us a very wide area of security and technology, some of the key takeaways that I see from your presentation is that the, we are at a crossroad. We are at a crossroad when there are really chances of many of these potential flashpoints going hot. And if they go, go hot, then it has global consequences, including consequences on Bangladesh. At least of the five possible flashpoints, three are in Asia, which has direct consequences for us. The Indo-Chinese border potential conflict is just next door and directly affects Bangladesh. So we need to understand and analyze these issues in depth. I also see your contention about robotics coming in in full force, which is about to happen or is happening, that will directly affect the future of work in Bangladesh, particularly in a labor-intensive country with a single export-driven economy. It, has, it can have devastating consequences. And that we must remember. Earlier on, I talked about second tier or third tier consequences of issues. If there is a conflict in Ukraine, for example, the Russian planes and Ukraine together is source of 37% of the global wheat export. So the food prices are going to hit absolutely above the ceiling which will have direct consequences for global food security and regional and international stability. So that's the consequences that we are talking about, and we all need to understand that. I'm also happy that you did point out about the metaverse. That is the world we are entering now in 2022. The internet is going to total transformation. We will not be entering the internet as a remote person anymore, but we will immerse ourselves into the internet through a second life. And that is the metaverse, the augmented reality world that will exist for all of us. And this is the world we need to understand. Therefore, I said that technology is going to drive everything that we do in the world, including security. So thank you very much for elaborating some of the key parts there. In our next segment, we are going to hear about geopolitics and strategy. And I could not think of any person better to explain this to us than our good professor, Dr. Lailu Foryaspin from the Department of International Relations in Dhaka University. Professor, you have the floor. 
thank you, sir, and thank you for your kind words. Um, I often tend to go a bit uh, speedily, so if you want, uh, you can interrupt me. Okay, uh, the topic today was given to me was strategic and geopolitical trends. I have um, sort of edited it a little bit uh, by calling it a strategic and geopolitical and geoeconomic trends. Uh, my previous two speakers uh, have uh, solely, um, you know, uh, emphasized on um, economic issue and also security and technological issues. Um, I'm afraid my uh, points uh, will somehow uh, overlap a little bit, although I'll try to differentiate in light of, uh, um, you know, what they have already presented or they have analyzed. Um, so, um, although Sar has started uh, by saying that uh, more than three points often convolute our understanding, uh, I'm afraid I have five points to talk about. Um, so, first uh, would be geoeconomic aspects. Second would be environmental consequences, um, then would be geopolitical uh, issue, of course here I would pay more attention, um, and then what are the social features uh, that, that will have uh, strategic implication for countries, um, and last but not the least on some of the technological issues uh, which are entirely different than what Shabkat has already talked about. Um, so when we are talking about geoeconomics, uh, what are the strategic and geopolitical implications of that? Um, we often, um, as uh, Sar and um, Shapkat has also pointed out, that we often forget um, a chaos theory coming from mathematics presented in 1970s about complex interdependence and uh, the butterfly effect, uh, the flapping of butterfly in uh, uh, Africa, for example, will have uh, will it have any impact uh, in the activities uh, carry, being carried out in Brazil? Uh, unfortunately, with COVID-19, uh, the theory did not confine, remain confined uh, to mathematics only, but also in our day-to-day -day life and look at ourselves today, uh, we are, each, uh, each of us are being affected by this uh, flapping of butterfly in Wuhan and uh, now we are you know, economics, uh, politics, uh, social, uh, societal aspects, all are being uh, challenged. Uh, so when we are talking about geoeconomics and its implications, um, a, a number of uh, studies uh, tell us that uh, the uh, um, size of the uh, economy, global economy, will be 2.3 percent smaller in 2024 than it would have been had there not been the pandemic. So we are already shrinking uh, a, a, a sort of a size of the global economy significantly. Uh, with it comes uh, insular policies uh, uh, taken by uh, different countries, obviously for them, uh, for any of us, our uh, nationals, our citizens take precedence over uh, helping out the others. In this context, I would like to bring out that their uh, involvement in different charities, in different aid programs and different um, donations that will significantly decrease, which will have, which will have implications, especially in the case of refugees and in, in the case of Bangladesh, we have FDMN and their uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, future and their future. Uh, so we can see that how um, this uh, economic, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, contraction, it will have a greater impact and that will also be uh, a greater strategic and geopolitical implications. Now let's come to environmental issue. Uh, we know that uh, in the case of environmental issues, a number of uh, uh, points can be talked about, but uh, the recent climate action failure and then extreme weather condition um, and uh, biodiversity loss, uh, apart from other other issues, how this will have implications in 2022, uh, only uh, you know, time will tell because um, on environmental issues is very difficult to predict something and we can see the implications already on Maldives. Uh, we can see implications in America right now, how uh, winter has been delayed and uh, also in the case of Bangladesh, as we are shivering, some of us are shivering, we can see how winter is being delayed. The whole cycle of winter pattern it's, it's, uh, uh, or weather pattern, this has changed and we are seeing more extreme weathers, extreme winter and extreme summer. Uh, so this environmental uh, impact will have uh, long term implications because not only about how countries uh, take policies, but also how they have to prioritize uh, and they will have to look after uh, environmental refugees, a category that is not uh, uh, legally, uh, that does not fall under international legal criteria. Uh, but there are uh, not only IDPs internally displaced 
less population, but there are people going, uh, crossing, uh, you know, boundaries from one country to the other being compelled to do so. So this is something we often uh, pay very little attention to. Uh, then uh, we are, uh, let me come to uh, more geo, uh, focus on, let, uh, let me focus on geopolitical issues. Uh, okay, uh, there are a number of issues. First of all, international order. Uh, Shapkat has talked about Ukraine issues. So there are a number of frozen conflicts that we often forget to pay attention to. Ukraine is one of that, uh, one of those uh, frozen conflicts. Uh, there is conflicts within Soviet, uh, sorry, within Russia, Nagorno Karabakh and um, uh, those um, other areas. Uh, there are frozen conflicts in Korean Peninsula, there are conflicts in China, Taiwan. All of these uh, uh, have greater implications for Bangladesh um, and as well as uh, for the rest of the world because any, any uh, 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 sort of conflict taking place in one part of the world that will have uh, today or tomorrow will reach to us and to other completely on the different corner of the world. So there are frozen conflicts. Then uh, international order. We do not see any responsible power or locations of power uh, more uh, you know, solid as we have seen in the 20th century. So here, who is the responsible power who is going to uh, sort of uh, take into account of how uh, uh, a rule-based uh, international system will be followed? And who is defining rule-based international system? Uh, rule-based international system, does it uh, uh, include uh, democracy, semi-democracy, uh, 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 or what are the ways uh, freedom of speech are going, uh, is going to be ensured in this particular rule-based uh, system? Then another issue which also has been pointed out that instead of land-centric uh, uh, geopolitical issues, we are increasingly moving forward to uh, maritime centric uh, uh, geopolitical issues. Here uh, we can see both China and America in their two ocean policy, they are emphasizing uh, on uh, Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Uh, so therefore, we need to look into that how conflict is coming more towards the Bay of Bengal and what are the implications that can have for Bangladesh. For Bangladesh in particular, not only traditional sources of insecurity lies there, but also non-traditional sources of uh, insecurity lie there. For example, IUU, um, uh, illegal, unreported, and uh, uh, um, unregulated um, fishing. Uh, then there are, uh, you know, petty, uh, you know, uh, piracy, maritime piracy in the Bay of Bengal. All of these issues will take, uh, in the absence of a rule-based international order, they will only intensify for Bangladesh. Uh, and for Bangladesh being chair of IORA, for, uh, the Bangla it has a bigger, uh, you know, chance, uh, this time to uh, talk about some kind of cooperative mechanism where states can cooperate and not only states but non-state actors and how we can bring in all those you know uh, sort of uh, stakeholders in the conversation. Then once again in international order what we have seen AUKUS and its implications that we are seeing more and more uh, attention uh, being paid to short-term security issues, short-term, uh, you know, integration, short-term uh, uh, alliances, and what are the long-term implications of this? Very few uh, are paying attention to that, and um, therefore, uh, we need to look into how international order uh, is gradually changing and being volatile and unstable. Uh, so, AUKUS has a broad uh, security issues and arms race, uh, not only to Asia, but has also, to some extent, dethroned the centrality of Asia in talking about its own issues. Uh, so we need to look into these particular areas as well. Uh, here also, another issue, uh, uh, let me go to the next point, is that a social features that we are not paying attention to, which will have a both geostrategic and geoeconomic implications. For example, social co cohesion erosion, livelihood crisis, mental health deterioration, and graying of the great world, the la uh, uh, great powers. The last point where we can see the number of aging population is increasing in the in the Western countries, and uh, at, and at the same time, how we can see there is a barrier to migration to these countries. So how uh, great powers are going to tackle their graying population in the coming years? So this is something very less talked about issue, but this. This is this social feature, especially during the pandemic, uh, as Bangladesh is also planning now and taking active initiative to uh, export semi-skilled uh, uh, manpower instead of only exporting uh, its unskilled manpower. That is another area, another option has opened up for uh, 
uh, developing uh, de uh, 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 least developing countries. So now this phrase global Cinderella, this is uh, coming into you know more in vogue because now uh, uh, great powers need their Asian population to be taken care of by these global Cinderella's coming from Southeast Asian countries or South Asian countries. Uh, then we need to talk about mental health issues. In a, in a report published in this year, uh, in 2021 alone, uh, more than 100 of Dhaka, uh, uh, different university students have committed suicide. And this is, this is not the first time that this is happening, but uh, uh, maybe we have overlooked these issues in the past, but with the joblessness that has been happening in Bangladesh and throughout the world, we need to look into how mental health uh, condition is deteriorating. This is connected with the geoeconomic aspect because this pandemic is much different than any other pandemics that uh, or uh, economic uh, you know, state of the world that we have witnessed before, especially during the economic shock of 20, uh, 2007 and 2008. Because this time, this pandemic is leaving long-term implications. We are seeing long COVID, COVID happening. We are seeing people are not inclined to go back to 9 to 5 jobs so we need to think about new format uh, that would uh, uh, that would uh, be um, uh, acceptable for a uh, job market as well and what happens if uh, people are giving up jobs um, yesterday there were uh, two reports uh, i think uk has a, a very um, uh, high number of uh, inflation this year 5.4 percent if i'm not wrong uh, and not only that there was a very uh, touchy story that was published that food donation in uk and people when they were uh, whereas they used to donate uh, in a large amount of um, you know large amount of um, uh, food in the food banks but now they are coming up with just a can of uh, you know uh, can of peas can of uh, you know uh, some other uh, vegetables because their capacity to donate this is also decreasing so overall this the, the idea of empathy because people just simply cannot do it because they are jobless now. They need to fend for their own families first and then look after others. So this is not only happening in UK but also in other parts of the world. Uh, so we need to look into how the uh, uh, geoeconomic issues aspects, uh, the, uh, uh, the rising trend of um, um, you know uh, economic uh, uh, economic loss uh, in different countries, it has connected with social fees as taking place in uh, uh, in different countries as well. Then last but not the least, I would talk about technological aspects where digital dependency has increased to such a level that it has multifaceted implications. Not only we are talking about uh, people uh, needing, to, uh, needing more medical professionals for their eyes because we are spending more time in front of the screens, but also this has other, other uh, different kind of implications for examples, for uh, for example, um, uh, we are seeing that um, how uh, digital dependency is leading to uh, not only in-house jobs, but also in some cases entrepreneurship. In these cases, how this has uh, uh, these uh, kind of jobs are being lost. Um, and at the same time, I would talk about um, another aspect, a uh, space which has been covered by Shafkat a little bit. But uh, there has been an uh, increasing rise in uh, public and private sector in militarization of the space and uh, a race in the space. So what are the kind of implications of this uh, will have uh, in this year, uh, especially with uh, this is the first time that a man-made object is going to crash on, on, the, uh, on the surface of the moon and uh, something that we will not be able to witness because it's uh, going to happen on the other side of the moon. So this is something that we need to think about and uh, uh, we know that um, uh, a number of activities are, are uh, already regarding you know, space exploration is going to increase, but how to have a handle on uh, private activities as well as uh, a public activities, this is something uh, we need to pay attention to. Uh, last but not the least, I would uh, come to um, a number of conflicts that is happening in Africa, and we often think that it is at the, at the, the bay of uh, you know, world politics. Uh, for example, Somali civil war, uh, civil war, Eritrean Ethiopian uh, war, what is happening in Burkina Faso, all of these will have a different kind of implications, uh, but uh, often we think that it is happening in a continent that is uh, far away from us, but this will have once again long-term implications. Uh, then again, 
Uh, when we are talking about uh, strategic issues, geopolitical trends, uh, we need to look into how geoeconomic uh, confrontations are also coming with BRI and uh, the idea about uh, you know uh, debt trap, um, uh, uh, which uh, uh, for, fortunately for Bangladesh it has not happened uh, happened yet, um, and also the, how, how far this has uh, any uh, validity. That is something we need to look into. Uh, for countries like Bangladesh, uh, what are the options? Um, uh, um, uh, in the in the coming um, uh, years, um, many many of us we forget that Bangladesh has been able to um, uh, develop itself using its own resources. And uh, just a while ago, I was uh, having a talk with Debo Priyo sir, and we were talking that how within Bangladesh uh, during 2020 2021 we have uh, um, uh, Bangladesh is one of the few countries where uh, very few people have died out of hunger. The prediction that World Food Program had a uh, number of um, you know. Uh, uh, food, uh, uh, the how food scarcity will increase, but this has been proven uh, quite wrong for Bangladesh. Why? Because within Bangladesh, a system has developed, uh, for example, in the uh, in developing its own farm agriculture, in developing its fishing industries, and the multifaceted uh, areas, uh, money has circulated within the economy. So this is something we have often uh, failed to pay attention to, and that is why well, in Bangladesh we have been able to sustain uh, despite uh, some of the countries have not been able to respond to the challenges of the pandemic uh, the, uh, as well as Bangladesh have been. Bangladesh has been. Uh, so, uh, with uh, a number of points, and if you have uh, any questions, certainly I would uh, uh, be happy to answer to. But uh, I'll, I'll end with uh, that. Uh, it is very difficult to. Uh, give prediction about what is going to happen because uh, the Ukraine issue was not much in, in, the, in the discussion in 2021 and I'll just uh, read from a list uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit has uh, given a list of 10 uh, you know, uh, issues to look forward to in uh, 2022 and in neither uh, in none of these uh, 10 issues ukraine is listed there uh, and uh, also none of those uh, 10 issues no african um, uh, conflicts are listed there so often we take very you know a uh, 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 top down approach in looking into issues that this is something we need to uh, get out of this mentality that we need to look into uh, you know from regional perspective uh, uh, and then go to global perspective i i overheard that talk uh, before that uh, this program today is talking about global challenges, not regional challenges that Bangladesh is going to uh, experience. Uh, but here again, Bangladesh is not at the bay of uh, uh, or at the end of, uh, or at the receiving end as it used to be 50 years back, something that we have been talking in uh, past uh, in, in 2021 and uh, um, uh, a lot that uh, a country which has uh, tra traveled through 50 years of its sovereign existence, it is time for Bangladesh to take a look at global issues rather than confining itself within the regional issues. Although Bangladesh has been called as a uh, emerging middle power by David Brewster and a number of other, you know, pat in the back we are hearing in, from different, uh, you know, uh, scholars uh, uh, writing from different parts of the world. But it's time that we also from Bangladesh start talking about global issues because whatever happening in, in Ukraine, whatever happening in Africa, whatever is happening in, in uh, China, the all of these, they have an impact on Bangladesh uh, directly or indirectly. So Bangladesh is not at the recipient end anymore. It is very much, uh, uh, very much uh, interested about what is happening in different parts of the world. And therefore, we need more of this kind of strategic talks about uh, and uh, futuristic uh, discussions uh, that BIFS uh, has a uh, uh, venture to take up on. So I thank BIFS for doing that. And I hope uh, more of these kind of talks will take place in future. Thank you very much. Dr. Yasmin, thank you very much for painting a very large picture of the landscape of geopolitics and strategy and the interactions between the two. I now have the pleasure to open the floor for our participants and audience. Just a few house rules. Please introduce yourself when you want to make a, ask a question or make an observation. Please be very brief. And I would also like to remind you that Everything we are speaking here today is on record because everything that is discussed here will also come out in a supplement by our co-sponsor organization, Naga Tribune, and it should be out in, a, in about a week's time. 
So with that, the floor is open. And the first question is Professor Basi from East West University. Thank you, sir. And let me tell you, it's a relief that the, uh, I'm cherishing the freedom to ask questions. And again, uh, first of all, uh, commendations to all the three distinguished speakers. Uh, and I'll be brief because this is not about me. And it's also in the interest of the audience. Two observations and a question each to each of the designated speakers. Uh, first of all is, again, uh, Devo Pio Sir, and I would use the word Sir because he has earned it. Devo Pio Sir has actually basically made a very commendable, succinct summary of what Bangladesh lies. And there's just one or two points that, again, I would like to add as an observation because he had paucity of time. And number two, I've been saying this for quite some time. And there's just one question for many of the students that I teach in economics who wants to ask me, and I do not have, I do not believe I have the ability to come up with a satisfactory answer. And I think you could provide to the audience. Number one is, we say that Bangladesh's external debt <coughs> is at a manageable level. Two years back, it was external debt to GDP ratio was 14%. Only last year, hold it like only that. last year, it has shot up to 19%, but still it's manageable proportions. But this is one thing that is, comes as a surprise, number one, that the G20 initiative offered us debt relief and, and debt suspension, actually, for a period of two years, if I could pick it up from the newspapers. But Bangladeshi government chose not to take that debt suspension relief. And it has been estimated from World Bank, not my estimation, that we could have probably uh, spared ourselves an expense of $330 million. So what was the logic behind this, number one? That's one question that has been doing the rounds. Number two is that we already have, and sir, even in your, uh, uh, in your presentation, we have a twin deficit scenario. And also, there are impending talks of a Fed reserve hike. And if the interest rate hike does take place, and as you've also pointed out, not only there's an exchange rate effect, but there's a cost push inflationary effect, especially in terms of importing oil and food. And you've also talked about structural adjustment, which means painful economic reforms. The current government in its three avatars has been quite lucky that they have carried out expansionary demand uh, management policies. But right now with the pandemic in and the financial resources in not the best possible shape, would we have a stagflationary scenario? Because that is the question that comes to our mind because reading between the lines. So that's for you. For Shafkat, or Mr. Shafkat Munir, fantastic performance on a very dry technical issue. No, no. We have to be formal. But one question over here, just only one question. Our dependence on Chinese technology is increasing, for better or for worse. We won't go into this. And if somebody had a naughty turn of mind, that's not me, we could say that the Global Magnitsky Act was imposed on Bangladesh the same day when Huawei basically signed a 5G agreement with Teletalk. Now, that could be basically a spurious correlation. But we have also seen that there's been repeated Western and US reservations regarding Bangladesh's closer integration with the Chinese sphere of influence. And they have not made any bones of this. So what should our strategy be? That's the question that I, would, if you have the time to shed on. And for Professor Lailufer, again, he, he, there was a very scholarly discussion about global trends, and that's absolutely right. Though I would rather say that again, I, would, I prefer, personally prefer the chaos theory of international relations, which is a, actually a better, uh, what would it say, intermediate approach as opposed to the realist approach and as opposed to the liberal view, as you have said about Robert Jervis, or for that matter, Kisan or Piper. Now, one of the things that remains over here, how will Bangladesh fare? Because, see, we are a system ineffectual state, as you, and you are very well aware of the jargon. And I would rather say in a paper that I published that we operate like a trading state, like Rosencreen. We can always argue about this. But because of our trade interdependence, as Dr. Devopi had pointed out, 60 to 70%, we are dependent on foreign economy. The USA is our largest export market. And there is already talks about 
further sanctions which might affect our RMG exports. And there's also this over-reliance on China, necessary reliance on China for infrastructure investment. How does Bangladesh manage? Thank you. Thank you, Pervez. Uh, the next question, Madam, you there? Yes, you have the floor. Please introduce yourself. Um, hello, my name is Lamia. I'm representing the Danish Embassy. Um, thank you for the excellent comments from the floor as well. I learned a lot. Uh, my question was for Mr. Munir because of his touch on security and technology. I understand that we've talked about robotics and automation, drone weaponization, and all of this and how Bangladesh needs to be prepared. We, what we haven't talked about is the massive tech debt, but the human capital management that needs to be addressed in order to catch up. So if there's any thoughts or recommendations from this group or anyone here, in fact, what kind of policy strategy there should be in order to manage our tech debt? All right. The next question here, please. Microphone here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Uh, myself, Major General Retired Shahidul Haq. Uh, my question is actually to the panel itself. Um, sir, my um, as a point is that with the rise of China, the global trend is and will be driven by China. Question to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Asha Kabir from Prothobalo. Uh, so my, um, one of my questions is to uh, Shafkat Mune. You, uh, the picture you gave was a very uh, almost apocalyptical picture with ro robotics and uh, artificial intelligence. And you also, in one of your recommendations, were saying to uh, sort of to include us in education to prepare us. So that is fine when you're talking about business, industry, and uh, education. But there's another side, which uh, I'm not sure how far Bangladesh is prepared, and that's in our security, our military side, because even warfare and uh, military strategies are becoming so highly technological, relying on robotics and artificial intelligence and such, which, so I really uh, am in the dark about how Bangladesh is faring this. We might not be in active warfare, but even as a deterrent, and you can never know, tell in the future the way the world is going, how far is Bangladesh's military preparing for this? And uh, for Laila for Yasmin, I have another question about the social aspects which you are bringing about. There was one thing I was wanting to know about, how far has this uh, whole, this glo in global trends, what about human trafficking? Because that's like a huge huge issue nowadays and especially with COVID, the COVID pandemic, there's been a, a bit lax um, control over this. We've seen this in our own country, in the refugee camps, not just in Bangladesh, but all over the world. So what do you think are the trends about human trafficking? Thank you, ma'am. Our next question is from Zahid from Aviation University. The latest addition to the list of universities in Bangladesh. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Zahid. Uh, I work in uh, Bang Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Aviation and Aerospace University. So some of the questions that you have been uh, pointing out, it relates to what we do. And we are a very new university. So uh, robotics is very much one of our department, mechatronics, aviation engineering. These are aerospace engineering very much. Uh, uh, we, it's a public university, so very much in the forefront of our uh, future journey in making, uh, uh, producing the human capital that you, that you talked about. So, but then my question is, I'm also, uh, I also happen to be an um, international relations, uh, a reader in international relations, politics and international relations. So my question to the audience, I have actually two. One, it appears to me uh, that, I'm sure most of you will agree that uh, the, re uh, the world is moving towards a multipolar system. And there is no denial of that. But yet we see uh, this multipolarity is producing, if I take the words from the, uh, from the speakers, is producing hotspot, democratic blacksliding, hybrid warfare. So the question uh, from an academic point of view, do you think multipolarity is supposed to be more inclusive, supposed to generate peace? Have we have, uh, does, does this hypothesis seems tenable that multipolarity breeds insecurity 
And from a regional perspective, it makes regional alliance building denser, determinative. And then subsequent to that, linking Bangladesh to that, under that conditions, how does Bangladesh continue pursuing a policy of friendship to all, malice to none? That would be a puzzle that we, uh, I would hear to have some answer to. And uh, the other one is uh, to our, our very, uh, my very beloved mentor, um, Dr. Devapriya, sir. Uh, I, I listened to your presentations, papers, and uh, most recently your policy prescriptions for the COVID-19 uh, stimulus packages. Surprisingly, there is one sector, uh, and you mentioned about the uh, uh, sea transportation, but there's no mention about the air transportation. That is one sector that has actually seen growth during the COVID period in cargo transportation. The sliding of passenger uh, uh, demand reduced from reduced to around 60, plummeted to 65% global, but the cargo was only 8.7%. And increasingly, the airlines industries are earning their major revenue by transporting cargo. Now, do you think that merits that the incentive or the stimulus packages that we offer from the government side uh, makes the aviation sector, particularly those who are operating cargo, more of a valid recipient of those, uh, those stimulus packages? I haven't seen those in your papers that you have written with some other. That's, what, that, that's my question, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I should also thank Dhaka Tribune and BIPS for taking us out of the pandemic. This is the first round table I'm attending over the last two years. I had attended some of the virtual ones. I must also thank uh, the panel because I thought I'd learn something about the global trends, which I have. But I have one uh, worry in the global trends impacting on Bangladesh politics. You talked about geopolitics, economics, security, but politics is the hottest topic today. No? Democracy, human rights, U.S. Treasury sanction was talked about, Magnet, Magnitsky, right? And then um, uh, today's Economist has thrown out an article which directly talks about Bangladesh's uh, state of instability. Maybe you would like to make some comments on that. The panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, you have the floor. Uh, I'll come back to you, Roost. Next. Yes. Please be very brief. We are almost coming towards the end of the time. Yes. Mr. Zamzim. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, at the outset, let me thank the organizers for organizing this very illuminating discussion. Uh, this is Jahan Zip Khan from the Pakistan High Commission. Uh, just a one comment and one question. So uh, we're talking about the pandemic and uh, the, the global situation. Uh, I think it's undoubtedly the pan pandemic has unleashed uh, new trends and has exacerbated the existing ones, which include uh, global inequalities, uh, the technological divide, emergence of a new global power, geopolitical tensions, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, in that regard, I would like to point out two important trends, and then I would be seeking your views on that. Uh, number one, there is uh, a markedly uh, visible trend for disregard of international law, multilateralism, and, and, and undermining of global cooperation and solidarity. And I think in, in that context, it is very important to point out that uh, there was no mention of the role or the importance of the United Nations or the role of global cooperation or solidarity to address the, the current or existing challenges, uh, which was uh, conspicuously absent from the points which have been made by uh, the distinguished panelists. Uh, uh, number two, uh, the, the, the other trend I which I would like to point out is uh, the rise of uh, far-right and fascist ideologies in different parts of the world, including in South Asia, which we believe have, 
have uh, the, the potential to undermine social stability and to undermine regional peace and stability. So we would like to have your views on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Shahid, uh, Shahid Akhtar. I worked in the foreign ministry, home and abroad, for many years. I'm now with uh, a chamber. Uh, well, having said that, uh, I'll make, uh, as you mentioned, we are under the pressure of time constraint. I'll make a generalized question instead of making it a separate question. Uh, I think we have uh, learned a lot and talked about vast uh, what would uh, make the global trends in 2022. That is uh, the year we are just ushered uh, in the month of January. We are still in January. And uh, I will not go, but the biggest challenge uh, the ILO has been talking about that there will be over nearly 5 million unemployment in the world. Uh, I, I, I'm sure they, they have uh, offices all over the world to gauge this figure. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we see that uh, we need, uh, uh, we, are, we talked about how to send our, you know, qualified people abroad. But what about, uh, you know, 100 export processing zone and high tech parks and whatnot? Do we have uh, qualified people in the country? There is a vast dearth of these qualified people. Uh, I don't know what preparation is, uh, you know, underway, uh, but very little in the sense that we still see a large number of uh, people coming and getting good employment opportunities in Bangladesh. And this is a big uh, concern. And uh, uh, there is a vast unemployment in Bangladesh. The other day in my office, we just wanted somebody uh, we received very qualified people, uh, over 300 applicants, uh, all with very high qualified uh, degrees. And uh, it was very difficult to pick the right person because I'm sure they'll not fit in, in this job, but people have applied because there's no job in the country. So this is something which, which is the beginning of, uh, you know, uh, the COVID, the impact of the COVID. And uh, this is not going to go away in, in the coming year. This is what ILO also thinks about it. So what uh, sort of preparations we are undertaking in this matter? Thank, Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I'm afraid we will not be having time for more questions, but one last question will go to any one of the young friends or students coming from the universities, because it is our endeavor, and BIPS is always to encourage our young friends to come to our events and ask questions and give your comments. So the last question goes to any of the students sitting at the back there. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for the floor. I am Bushra Altaf Chaudhary. I have recently graduated from East West University la two months ago in the Department of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. Currently, I'm serving as the uh, content uh, manager in, ma in a master peer. Anyways, uh, in uh, relation to the uh, very important question the last sir has uh, brought about regarding unemployment, my question is that in a survey conducted by UNICEF uh, worldwide, they have found out that 616 million children has been affected by partial and full school closure around the world. Now coming uh, to global trends in 2020, uh, before we used to see that even though education system was full, uh, fully open around the world and uh, many children were out of the uh, uh, educated uh, margin. Currently, uh, even though many countries are conducting online classes and online operations in education facilities, there the dropout rates of children from schools is very high. So. Uh, do you think, sir, that in the recent years to come, the uh, unemployment rate and uh, the rate of educated people uh, in the country, later rate of literacy, is it expected to drop or more people will be uh, shifting to jobs uh, after completing college and will not be going for universities or something like that? Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now go back to our panel. Since we have very little time, I will request each of you to take about two or two half minutes so that we can finish on time. So we'll first go in the reverse order to Dr. Yasmin first.
Okay, thank you, sir. A uh, number of questions uh, were there and fear, some of them were directed to me. So I'm just, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, only a few issues. Um, one is, uh, one. there was a question on multipolarity. Um, in fact, it is very difficult to uh, uh, state that the current world order is multipolar. Uh, instead, um, a number of uh, scholars and policymakers are calling it plurilateral, uh, which means that, he, as I said uh, during my presentation, that uh, states are um, going for short-term alliances as their interests and needs for the time being suits. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a, it's a it's very difficult for us to uh, sort of um, uh, term this particular system as multipolar. But yes, multipolar uh, world uh, may bring uh, insecurity or also generate peace for a while. Uh, but generally, in terms of polarity, we have seen bipolar world uh, to provide some semblance of um, uh, you know stability in the world. Not that I'm encouraging any Cold War uh, or any this sort of uh, uh, future world order, because we also have seen the repercussions of a cold war um, uh, in, de in other parts of the world. Then another um, question was on global governance, uh, the role of UN uh, and uh, other um, such um, international cooperative mechanism. Uh, so here, in fact, when we're talking about, um, as I was talking about strategic and geopolitical trends, and uh, we have seen how United Nations and international cooperation, they have been largely ineffective uh, during um, uh, um, this whole pandemic period. Why? Uh, I had a couple of points uh, jotted down, but I forgot to talk about those. Um, uh, vaccine hesitancy, vaccine nationalism, vaccine diplomacy, all of these and even uh, in fact uh, unfortunately once again in UK there has been a rise of sovereign citizens of the planet. You know this kind of particular mentality and we have seen in Europe how uh, there has been a rise of hyper nationalism, there has been a rise uh, and uh, um, you know um, sort of uh, protest against government decision and uh, the idea that government cannot take any decision about someone's body because the body is sovereign and some Somehow or the other, I go back to the era of Thomas Hobbes who wrote about Leviathan. So uh, we are talking about, are we living in 21st century or are we living in that uh, 16th century, 17th century when we are talking about that we do not need any social contract. So how does, how, how will the world look in coming, war, uh, coming uh, uh, you know, years if we are talking about a sovereignty uh, cannot be claimed by a, by a state over uh, its nationals. So this is something we, we have a lot of work to do in this regard. Um, and then again, um, human trafficking. Uh, I think uh, human trafficking is something that uh, from the very beginning of humanity, we, we travel, uh, whether there is a way or there is, uh, uh, you know, whether there's a complicated, um, you know, uh, path to go somewhere. So human trafficking has not stopped. And uh, they will always find uh, uh, different ways, uh, uh, very new ways, fresh ways to do that. As we have seen that uh, how, uh, you know, Rohingyas have found ways to go from travel from Cox Bazaar to Rongpur and other areas. Uh, so human trafficking, uh, it has been going on and uh, the trend will continue as long as we will not be able to provide uh, some safe, uh, you know, economic uh, condition in uh, uh, our own countries. But then again, you can see that how in America or in uh, Western Europe, how uh, people are uh, being, uh, people are reluctant to do job over vaccine mandates. Uh, but then if those jobs are being fulfilled by uh, migrants, uh, but of course uh, there is a uh, barrier to migration in, in um, a proper channel, but um, therefore it will only encourage uh, this illegal uh, human trafficking. So that, that will continue, I believe, uh, with or without COVID-19 uh, in 2022 or maybe in 20 years time, whether I'll, I'm not sure whether I'll be here to see that and support your, you know, this argument, but it will continue for a while in fact. Um, so I think I'll leave the mic to Radha Shafkat. All right, Shafkat. Thank you. Uh, very interesting questions. A couple of them have been directed towards me. Let me start with the point about military preparedness and technology. And I think that's an absolutely wonderful point. I'm very heartened to see that uh, at the conclusion of the recent uh, winter exercises, the Chief of Army Staff has categorically stated uh, to the press that uh, Bangladesh Army is already looking at induction of artificial intelligence in its training. So we are already thinking about it, and that's very impressive. So um, 
it would be very important for us to continue to uh, see how we can in better integrate technology into our military preparedness. Uh, going back to Lamia's point about human capital management, I think that's also very important. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right that we, uh, in order to win in this tech race, we have to be very careful about how we plan in terms of our capacity building and skills development because ultimately quite a lot of it would depend on how well we can develop our skills and uh, how, what kind of skilled human resource we can send to the market because the market's uh, competitiveness, the market's nature is going to change fundamentally. So uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, last but not the least, uh, Mr. Pervez Abbasi's point about uh, 5G and uh, whether uh, the ramifications of it. Uh, we should be at liberty to work with everybody. But as I always uh, want to say, it's like a human relationship. You have to go with your eyes open and be cognizant about the pitfalls and challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Debrupio. Thank you. Uh, when I was young, I mean younger, I used to think that uh, I have the answers to all questions. Now that I am becoming a senior citizen, I have become one, uh, I now know giving a good question is sometimes is much more challenging than having the answer. So compliments to all of you for making those points. And since uh, General Munir is not offering us dinner, so we'll have to leave this vacate this place soon. So let me be very brief on these issues and leave the rest for some other occasion. Thank you for those very good questions, Professor Nassim. Nassim, is Abbas. Abbas, Professor Abbas. So the, on the debt issue, uh, the Bangladesh also did not go for HIPIC, the highly indebted countries uh, relief uh, arrangement. Uh, for a number of reasons, first of all, we do not qualify for that because of that we have a very good track record of paying back our debts. Uh, number two, we, have, we do not have that extreme balance of payment situation. Uh, we do have foreign exchange reserves. And more importantly, the composition of our debt is such that it does not really address much of the G20 debtors in that way. So on the, on the debt, sir, debt issue, uh, the, it was uh, less than 40% the, till the other day. You mentioned 90%. 90. One nine. One nine. Oh, no, it's, 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 it's a crossing 40%. It is, it's a 42, 43. And my projection is that it, it will cross 50% more than that. There is an accounting issue, transparency issue of budget financing of foreign aid. Um, so I do not see a Sri Lanka situation immediately, but one has to be very vigilant about it. Debt servicing liability is under control over there. On your twin deficit, yes, fiscal and the balance of payment issues. Uh, the, the, the major challenge is where, what would be the anchor of macro stability? Whether it is your exchange rate, whether it is your interest rate, or it is your inflation. My preference is inflation. Um, inflation will really drive the rest of the year, as I can see, and it is will be one of these. And if it drives for two more years, and this is for General Amsami, this is my, I do not understand politics. I understand economics, sometimes political economy. And then that, so my political economy is that any government will hate to go to an election with high, in, high inflation rate with the cost of doing, along with the cost of doing business. Uh, let me, we will have a side chat afterward. On the issue of this um, China rising issue, you see, for me, it's a much more important thing, and it, that relates to the colleague from the Pakistan mission, is that whether we are having all the rise of China will contribute to strengthening of a rule-based system in the world. Will it contribute to multilateralism? So, because for countries like Bangladesh, the most important global public good is a multilateral rule-based system Absolutely. where for, uh, we will have to look for. So, it is an open question to all of you that whether the rise of China, and by 2028, it may become the largest economy in the world, although it will still remain an upper, upper, lower, uh, upper middle income country, and it is 57th in the rank of PPP in terms of per capita income. So you see, it is a very disproportionate economic structure in that way. But my interest about China is that, will it be a driver for multilateralism in the future? That's a question we need to answer. On the issue of this uh, 
um, <laughs> issue of unemployment. Where is Ambassador Shahid? Yes. That I think you have touched the, I think, the most sensitive part of it in that way. At this very moment, and I go on quoting this number everywhere, and this is a pre-COVID number, that every fourth person in this country is unemployed. Mm. Underemployment <coughs> is even more than that, one third of it. But more importantly, this is a number, please memorize. Every third educated person is unemployed, which means the more educated you are, the higher is the propensity to remain unemployed. Let me give you just one, if I am allowed to. Day before yesterday, BBC called me and asked, you see, the Bangladesh is doing tremendously well, but why on earth then your, then your citizens are dying in the Mediterranean? So out of the 287 people, uh, 273 were Bangladeshis, of which seven died. And I told them, you see, this is the, and this is my last point, the, the, the nature of development is such that it is being able to cater our elites, it is being able to cater our poorest of the poor with the social safety net programs, but it is not attending to the emerging middle class. It is not attending to the educated young people at this moment. That is the major problem. Look into that. Those 200. 73 people who are there in those containers, most of them are below 40 and they possibly have an, a college level education up to a point. So we are not being able to address that part in that way. Our growth narrative, our development narrative is at this moment in a denial syndrome to look into that. And that will also include the education issue where we are seeing the dropout rates are going to increase. We will see I run schools, I sit in the board in my committees, I know. 20% child marriages before they went for this type of these intermediate exams and it will increase child labor as it has happened in this the other factory which we have seen these are the all fallouts over there so I think we have to have a bit of a reality check and come out with our future in the next year or two and 2022 will check will be definitely checking our, our resilience to its ultimate limit in many many ways thank you very much thank you very much this has been a very rich and fascinating discussion so for the interest of time i will not venture to summarize it rather hand over to my co-host mr zafar soban editor of dhaka tribune zafar you have the floor for the last time I apologize for being late to the uh, party, but I was unavoidably detained at another uh, meeting. And it seems to me, of course, that I've been amply punished because I really feel that I've missed out from not actually listening to the first two um, presentations today. I think I got a feel of them from the questions in the last round, but I very much look forward to the video which we will be bringing out um, on our social media platforms, which will um, which will allow this discussion to go forth and uh, be shared with a wider audience. And of course, as the general has mentioned, we will also write it up in Dhaka Tribune in seven to 10 days. I think um, by uh, means of summing up, which as I said is difficult to do since I wasn't here for the bulk of the discussion, well, I can say is, I mean, I think with, and we've touched on this. Do, do you really need to hear everything to sum up? I didn't do that anyway. <laughs> Well, I have, uh, I'm, I'm still new to the game, though, if you're So, you know, I agree. Uh, a more able uh, a chair or host would not even need to be uh, there for that. But I think when we talk about Global Trends 2022, and I think uh, this has been what the speakers in the, uh, in the audience have talked about, is that we can really not talk about 2022 in isolation, because this is really the start of uh, you know, it's uh, sort of a new, a, a new world order, a new way of doing things. And I think really it's going to be, um, maybe if we take a look at a horizon of the next seven to eight years and see where we are, 2028, 2030, that would be um, more helpful. I think a lot of these trends will only start becoming apparent um, in this year. And I think we're just now coming out of all of the changes which have been wrought because of um, COVID, which is really on the one hand, put the world in deep freeze, or a lot of these trends in deep freeze for a couple of years, and on the other hand, has also given us a somewhat of a taste of some of the issues which will um, 
occupy our thoughts and dictate our policies both um, internally, regionally, and globally uh, coming forth. In conclusion, I should say that this is a subject, um, 2022 and beyond, which we try and discuss um, on, in the pages of Dhaka Tribune, which is one of the reasons we partner with BIPS in this endeavor. Recently, in fact, today and yesterday were two op-ed pieces which I'd like to bring to the attention of all of the um, uh, guests and panelists here, which I think would be very worthwhile reading because they touch upon the issues we've been touching upon. Uh, the first today which came out was by Forrest Cookson, who is of course well known to a number of people here. Yesterday it was by Farid Bakht, who is also a columnist we have of some repute and is always worth reading. And I of course, um, I invite all of you to continue this conversation in the pages of the Dhaka Tribune because I can think in this day and age of no more important conversation that we all need to be having. So once again, I thank you to BIPS uh, for co-hosting uh, this event. Thank you to our panelists and thank you all our audience here. Before, yeah, before we conclude, please join me in thanking our members of the panel. Give them a very big hand, please. <laughs>